so welcome to nonlinear control um, we have been uh, looking at feedback generation for the past well maybe couple of weeks i guess yeah may, may have seemed longer to you but it has been maybe couple of weeks all right um, so um, we did a little bit of the proofs yeah i of course did not uh, prove the key result i left it uh, for you to read or maybe you know i do it in the end if there is time and so on or we can some of us can discuss it and so on yeah um, but we looked at the 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 key applications right uh, and that's of the frobenius theorem which is essentially uh, saying that involutivity and uh, you know complete integrability of this uh, distribution is equivalent okay so this is what we have sort of seen in the Frobenius theorem and we were looking at how to use it okay so for the um, you know for the uh, fully feedback linearizable case it sort of gives us a very nice uh, set of partial differential equations so that you can actually identify this control right so we actually looked at it uh, specifically for the uh, DC motor case right so there was this DC motor dynamics um, slightly different from this of course there was this additional thing here which is essentially this guy yeah and there was this so basically it is an fx plus gxu uh, we've been looking at single input systems right just to make things easier for us and essentially we were required to check only two conditions right first is that this um, g uh, add so add f 0 g add f 1 g add f 2 g all the way to add f um, n minus 1 g yeah is supposed to be linearly independent so in this case n minus 1 g is just add f 2 g so this was one thing that was that we were required to verify uh, I, I believe we were able to verify this one uh, I guess so we did g f g and then add f 2 g was the one which was sort of complicated I'm not sure if we actually verified this right we said that we'll do some of this offline okay or even numerically for that matter yeah and then the second one was that uh, we wanted to check the involutivity of uh, add f 0 g add f 1 g all the way to add f n minus 2 g distribution made by these vector fields right and so we did in this case add f n minus 2 g is basically just add f g and this was basically very easy to uh, you know verify so we had g and add f g and we just want to check if this is involutive right so all we had to do was just see if uh, g um, and f g lee bracket uh, is it turning out to be in the distribution itself or not and so we actually verified this that uh, g and f g when you take the lee bracket of the two it turns out to be zero i believe right that's what we got so uh, let's see let's see yeah yeah that was uh, so f g was this g was this uh, I actually very so yeah this was add f2g which turned out to be very complicated so and then we were trying to verify that g and f of g f g lee bracket is in the distribution this is very easy because this turns out to be uh, I believe turns out to be zero no yes this turns out to be zero correct this turns out to be zero and therefore this is trivially true that that this uh, is in fact in the distribution because if you take any vector space zero is in the vector space obviously right so therefore uh, we were able to verify the involutivity condition once we had these two conditions we know that it is fully feedback linearizable and then all we have to do is uh, to to sort of use this equality which is basically saying that uh, you know the the you know the d beta whichever whatever is your output because now we are trying to figure out the correct output with respect to which with the system is feedback linearizable right and so let beta be that output so all we are saying is that this d beta is linearly independent so therefore this d beta product with vectors of the distribution is exactly zero right and this is just an evalu evaluation sorry uh, yeah it's actually evaluating these uh, you know partial derivatives here so you get a bunch of equations in partial derivatives and at this point you can pretty much uh, you know um, you, you get a few conditions you get that partial of b with respect to x1 is zero so therefore there is no dependence on x1 so we have only dependence on x2 x3 and then once you have dependence on x2 x3 you can use the second equality to 
conclude that beta comes out to be something like this, right. So, if you remember we had looked at the DC motor example earlier also and we had sort of guessed some outputs, yeah and how did we do that? We sort of, uh, we were only looking at partial feedback linearization, yeah because we started with say person output x2 and then we only got relative degree 2, not relative degree 3, therefore the system was not fully feedback linearizable with x2 and so on and so forth. So, we tried different things and then we just tried to find a, uh, so basically what we were doing was we had fix sorry not x2 but x3 we had fixed the output okay here with this knowledge of frobenius uh, theorem and the lee brackets we are going backwards we are trying to identify what should be the output y with respect to which the system can be feedback linearizable fully feedback linearizable and so in this case it turns out that this is in fact that output okay even if this is unintuitive and whatever i mean it may not be something that's uh, uh, making any physical sense to us but this is what it is, okay, all right. Uh, uh, there is this small little spacecraft rigid body example that I have also sort of done here. I am not going to uh, cover this. I want you to uh, take a look at this on your own, yeah. I have asked for this output with respect to which you get full state feedback generation and in this case it turns out that I mean I have actually solved it, you can take y equal to rho itself which is the kinematics parameters, right. It can be the MR modified Rodriguez, or it can be quaternion, whatever. I, I believe this is written with respect to the uh, modified Rodriguez parameters, yeah. This is the rigid body equations you have in the current homework also I believe, right. So then basically with this output it turns out that you can get uh, you know your adequate linearized or a, the feedback linearized system, alright under certain conditions of course, right. Uh, so anyway, so I have, I have actually done some computations and so on and so forth. I would leave you to uh, look at this on your own, okay. So that sort of brings us to the uh, end of what we wanted to do with feedback generation. Uh, as the TAs have announced, you have a tutorial, right. Uh, you will do a little bit more. I have in, I mean I have instructed them to sort of. Uh, bring some interesting problems where you are actually computing these Lie brackets because that is the challenging part. Just guessing an output and keep taking derivatives is easy because that is not difficult right. You take an output and then you keep taking derivatives wherever the control shows up, you get the relative degree, then you guess the rest of the states, that is still okay, yeah. But this is a little bit more complicated but this has a little bit more general applicability. Therefore, I have asked them to take up some interesting examples, um, you, you are also free to bring your own examples, yeah, and try to discuss it in the tutorial, yeah, that is fine, alright, okay, great. Uh, now what we want to do is, I am actually uh, pulling out a little bit of what I taught in adaptive control, because I am going to give you now, uh, we are essentially uh, more or less at the end of the standard design methods, yeah, there are no more generic standard design methods, okay. Um, everything else is very specific to systems and so on. So, you have learned until now Lyapunov redesign, right, basically find, take a Lyapunov function or a control Lyapunov function and try to identify a control by taking derivative of the control Lyapunov function along with system trajectories, that was the first one. Then we went to backstepping, right, which is basically how to construct these control Lyapunov functions sequentially, right. And then we went to passivity based ideas where if you have some passivity inbuilt in the system, then you have a certain structure, uh, you can actually come up with the nice storage function. You can take the storage function and come up with, um, you know, nice Lyapunov functions, right. So, you also have this passive interconnections and things like that. So, we did the passivity based methods. Uh, then we did the feedback linearization, which is not based on the Lyapunov method at all. It is just um, property of the system itself, okay. It basically gives you some kind of nonlinear uh, state transformation, which will make your system appear linear, okay. So, that is really the idea. So, uh, there are no other generic methods. Now, it is more, uh, now it is more on uh, what kind of problems you are trying to solve. So, adaptive control is one such uh, problem in uh, like a uh, scenario in nonlinear control, yeah, which occurs very commonly in nonlinear control. And what is the scenario? The scenario is that you have unknown parameters in the system, yeah. These unknown parameters could be mass, inertia and things like that. Of course, more recently um, some of you might be aware there is this uh, neural networks and deep learning because of you know very good computational facilities now. 
um, has become very very popular. So all neural network and deep learning is doing exactly this, identifying parameters. Okay. So what it does is a, 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 in in typical adaptive control, the way we te we teach it, we are just trying to learn some constant parameters of the system. Okay. Uh, when we are working with neural nets and uh, deep learning algorithms, you are trying to identify functions, not trying to identify points and parameters, but trying to identify functions. But uh, there is a very, very nice classical result which says that any function can be linearly parameterized uh, in terms of the standard radial like basis functions. Yeah, these could be radial basis functions or activation functions and things like that. Okay. So, so that is what neural network does. It basically thinks of uh, you know functions as a linear combination of some uh, standard basis functions right and then all you have to identify is again some constant parameters all right so you are back to an adaptive control type problem okay so uh, you can even use the adaptive control framework in learning yeah which is actually sort of well understood yeah so mm, anyway so so applications of adaptive control are significant uh, even in even before we were doing learning and stuff even when there are basic parameters or system that are unknown you know like mass inertias these are not easy to quantify especially when you talk big systems like spacecraft uh, aircraft yeah or uh, where you're losing fuel uh, or there is some damage to say your propellers a lot of unknowns or if there is a sensing error yeah so these all factor in as unknowns unknown parameters we again deal with constants here uh, but this has still a lot of utility yeah so um, these are the scenarios where you cannot adequately model the system like if you if you talk about a you know thousand kg or a, you know five thousand kg spacecraft you cannot really you know uh, do rotational testing and all that to get some inertia values and all so whatever you have is a guess so it's better to then use something like an adaptive control okay all right um, so before we even do any adaptive control we need to look a little bit at uh, some key results that we use very commonly in adaptive control uh, of course we use the stability theorems that you already know but we also use a little a few additional results yeah uh, these are very powerful and um, so we need to state them and sort of look at how they are used yeah first so the first is uh, there are a few lemmas so the first one is basically this lemma 1.1 which says that if you have a function f which is bounded below and not increasing okay so what is it it's bounded below and not increasing meaning uh, if you have a function like this uh, say there is a bound below and it's not increasing so it's like this it could be constant it could be going down constant going down constant going down yeah can never go up yeah this is the kind of function we are talking about it has a lower bound and it is non increasing okay it's then this lemma says that such functions have a finite limit as t goes to infinity okay so limit as t goes to infinity f of t is some finite limit okay the limit exists and is finite okay uh, so this is uh, a rather key result that we constantly invoke in what we call signal chasing analysis this also something we look at of course there is this exercise which says what is this finite limit yeah uh, i will leave it to you uh, because it says there is a finite limit the question is what might this finite limit be yeah anyway so i'll leave that to you okay uh, all right so the second lemma basically says it, it sort of gives you a result that helps you to evaluate uniform continuity of a function if you don't know what is uniform continuity of a function please go read it up huh? continuity is pretty simple you already know yeah again there are epsilon delta definitions for continuity similarly uniform continuity okay basically continuity doesn't depend on uh, the point you are evaluating that is what is called uniform continuity I mean, in general yeah typically when you say a function is continuous you say continuous at a point uniform continuity there is no continuity at a point it is wherever yeah okay but still if you are not clear you should look at the definition of uniform continuity all I am giving you is a sufficiency condition to verify uniform continuity what is the sufficiency condition if the derivative is L infinity okay and if you remember I told you L infinity is identical to boundedness any function L infinity implies the function is bounded exactly the same things okay so basically if your if your derivative of your function is in fact bounded then f is uniformly continuous 
okay this is an easy sufficiency check for uniform continuity yeah? yeah otherwise you have to check with the definition which is not easy typically typically hard yeah so uh, simple examples you can see i mean i mean because i know that f dot has to be bounded i know that sin t is uniformly continuous right uh, on the other hand if i take let's see um, sin t squared is it uniformly continuous sin t squared yes but why how is sin t what is the derivative of sin t squared is this bounded no not bounded yeah so you can't say anything about uniform continuity because this is only a sufficiency condition it doesn't say if it is not satisfying the boundedness what happens but this is not a uniformly continuous function sin t square is not uniformly continuous continuity depends on the t so when i say the continuity depends on the point it doesn't mean that it will become discontinuous at some point okay this comes from the epsilon delta definition continuity says that if you are given an epsilon there exists a delta if so that if the argument is delta away from a point then the function is epsilon away from the point okay now that epsilon can depend on time sorry the delta can depend on t epsilon cannot depend on anything in uniform continuity the delta does not depend on t okay anyway go look go back and look at the definition of uniform continuity this is basically just a test yeah sin t square does not satisfy the test okay sin t that satisfies the test sin t square no okay all right great um right right Yeah, so anyway, I mean, I mean, there's also a simple example here. If you take, uh, if you take x t, then you take the uh, two vector norm, then it's one. Yeah. So this is just talking about boundedness. So x is basically a bounded. It just says that x is in fact a, uh, in fact, not just x, x infinity. Yeah. The infinity norm of this signal is one. Right. Again, this is something we've already covered. Just how to compute the infinity norm. The infinity norm is just basically soup over time of this guy. Yeah. So x infinity is supremum over time of this, right? Of any vector norm. So here we take the two norm. Yeah. This is basically just saying that it's a bounded signal. It's fine. It's basically just that's it's. This is not talking about this result or anything. No. This is just saying that x is a bounded signal and therefore it is l infinity yeah any bounded signal is l infinity okay great so I, of course i have also given you this exercise define uniform continuity just so that you read it yeah and give the epsilon delta definition yeah not some arbitrary definition we need the epsilon delta definition okay now unfortunately in these notes everywhere this is wrong it is barbalat's lemma i don't know why we have made this blunder here. It's become Barber Rat's lemma. It's not a rat. It's a Barber Lat's lemma. There is no rat involved here. All right. Okay. So this is Barber Lat's lemma. All right. Uh, so uh, so why we talked about these results is because we wanted to uh, reach up to Barber Lat's lemma. This is a sort of um, equivalence or extension even of uh, Lasalle uh, Krasowski Lasalle's theorem in some ways. Okay, if you remember the Lasalle invariance is talking about uh, convergence to a compact set. Okay, but the Krasovsky Lasalle, um, whatever, uh, Barbashin Krasovsky Lasalle, right, uh, theorem was talking about convergence to the origin. Okay, when, when the V dot is negative semi definite only. Okay, but if you remember, everything we did in the, Kraso in the Lasalle invariance and required that the system be time invariant, autonomous system. Yeah, we were always dealing with autonomous systems. Here, the Babalat's lemma is going to state an equivalent result, but not necessarily for autonomous systems. Okay, this got no con no. Uh, you don't have to have an autonomous system. Okay, but again, this is only generalizing the barbashin krasovsky lasalle theorem. Okay, not the Lasalle invariance. Lasalle invariance is completely different and way more general because it is talking about convergence to a compact set. Yeah, 
Bablat's lemma does not do anything like that. So what is this Bablat's lemma saying? It says, it's a convergence result like I said. It says that if you have a function, can be scalar or vector value, doesn't matter. Of course, it's a function of time, therefore it goes to, I've said R, all right, such that the signal is integrable. What does integrable mean? Integrable means that this integral exists and is finite, okay. So, if you, if you integrate it from 0 to infinity, then it exists and is finite, okay. Further, suppose f is uniformly continuous, okay, then limit as t goes to infinity f of t is 0, okay. So, this is the convergence result. As you can see, you are talking about convergence, okay. And, and we have also, um, of course, later on you will see how we use it for states because this is just talking about a function, right. But if you remember, the state is also a function of time once you solve it. Once you solve the equations, the differential equations, it is a function of time and also initial conditions, okay. But still a function of time, right, once you fix the initial conditions also, alright. So this is a nice uh, convergence result which says that if the function is integrable and uniformly continuous, then the function goes to 0 as t goes to infinity, okay. There is also a, uh, of course, there is a nice note which says that in case of vector valued functions, the integral has to be satisfied component wise. So, basically it means that uh, component wise you want the, uh, the integral to have a finite limit, okay, that is it. So, there is a uh, simpler version or a corollary, yeah, what is the corollary? The corollary is basically that if the function is L infinity and LP for some P, which is not infinity of course, and further F dot is L infinity, then limit as t goes to infinity F of t is 0. So, this is a corollary of the previous result, hmm. this is a corollary of the previous result. Just note why this is a corollary. The first thing, f dot being in L infinity already implies that the function is uniformly continuous, correct? So that is what is the second condition here. Already I get one condition. Now this other condition, it looks like an integrability condition, right? Why? Because first you are saying function is L infinity, which means it is bounded. So leave that aside. But if the function is LP, what do you have? What does it mean for a function? to be LP, it absolutely, the, the P norm is integrable, the P signal norm. What is the P signal norm? The P signal norm is this, this is what we defined the P signal norm, right? Now if I say this is integrable, it is basically as good as saying that this is, I mean, to the power 1 pi p does not matter, right. If this is going to infinity, the to the power 1 by p is also infinity and vice versa, okay. So, when I say integrable, when I say that function is LP, I know that this is less than infinity, all right. This already looks similar to this guy, where there is no power of course, right. There is no power involved here, but very similar looking condition. So therefore, this is in fact a corollary, that is what I ask uh, you to prove, uh, I am going to cut this and I am going to say prove that limit as t goes to infinity. Yeah, basically I am saying if you have all these conditions, I want you to prove that the function goes to 0. Basically, I want you to use these conditions to go back to the Barbalat's lemma, original conditions, and therefore you have f going to 0 as t goes to infinity, okay, all right. So that's why, so basically proving that this is the corollary, okay. So this is the Barbalat's lemma. So the next step is to basically see how we can use the Barbalat's lemma, yeah. This is significantly simpler than all your feedback generation material, so you will follow this rather easily, okay.